عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. الحمد لله رب العالمين. الرحمن الرحيم. مالك يوم الدين. إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. إحدنا الصراط المستقيم. سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم سل وسلم بارك على سيدنا ولان محمد تبع القلوب ودواعيها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا سلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Inshallah, continuing with the topic of Imam Hussein al-Islam in Karbala. Unless... Sir, I can't hear. Hang on. With a jacket. Second from the bottom. On the right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, inshallah. You know, continuing with the topic again of Imam Hussein al Islam in Karbala. Um, you know, last week we talked about where on the 2nd of Muharram they had arrived in Karbala and were surrounded by all of these forces of Yazid several thousand army strong and the person who's eventually sent as the commander of all of these forces is Amr bin Sa'd who is the son of Sa'd bin Abi Waqas anhu, who was a very close companion of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you know we talked about how he accepted this because he was being offered the governorship of Ray or Tehran and if he didn't accept this mission, then that would be taken away from him. So, you know, this is where, you know, we need to understand. And one, several things we need to understand. One is that what Amr does, does not fall on his father. You know, there's certain people try to blame Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas for what Amr did. You know, if Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas had taught his son to do this, that would be a different issue. But here you have the father following one path and the son following a different path. To the extent that there is a narration in Sayyid Muslim where when Sa'ad Radion was living on the outskirts of Medina Munawwara, this son went to go visit him. And so this is, you know, a few years before Karbala. Sa'ad Radion passed away four or five years before Karbala. And so this son goes to visit him, and as he's riding in on his horse, Sa'ad Radion sees him, and he says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ومن شر هذا الرؤية ومن شر هذا الراكب that I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the outcast and the evil that is within this rider. And so he comes, he gets off of his horse, he goes to his father and he starts talking to his father about the politics of going on and why don't you get involved in all of this. And so Saad Radio hit him on the chest and said, you know, that be gone. So in essence he disowned him. You know, again, the father is on one path and the son is on another path. The other aspect of this also is that Amr bin Saad knew the status, the honor, the position of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He knew the connection of Imam Hussein alayhi salam to Rasulullah. 
And yet he still chooses, you know, for a few pennies, literally, you know, to become governor of a certain area where you're going to be collecting taxes and taking in all this wealth and have this prestige, which is going to last how long? You know, a few days, and then you're going to be dead. But he chooses that over the honor and status of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And Rasulullah has told us that none of you is a believer. And he said to us in the narration that none of us are believers unless we love him more than we love our forefathers, our progeny, and all of mankind combined. And another narration more than we love our forefathers, our progeny, and all of the wealth. So there is no iman. There is no faith unless we love Rasulullah so some more than everything else in the universe combined. And simply saying, oh, I love him, means absolutely nothing. You know, when the test comes, you know, like they say in English, the proof is in the pudding. You know? So if you're going to make a statement, then prove it. And again, Surah An-Kabut. That do you think you will be, does mankind think that they will be tested or that they can simply say that we believe without being tested? Allah. And so when the test comes, you know, what does Amr do? He chooses the temporary material gain and not even gain, the material things. One thing if you gain, but there's, no even, there's not even a gain in here. You know, just the temporary material things of this world over Iman. Because he knows what he's going to do. And, and statements later on will prove that he knows what he's going to do. And so he comes as the leader of this massive army, which eventually will end up around 22,000 people. And when he arrives, Imam Hussein al-Islam knows him. You know, he's one of the sons of Quraysh. Imam Hussein al-Islam is the leader of Banu Hashim. And he knows him. So he sends word with some people that, you know, to talk to him. And Amr, actually, when he arrives, he, he wants to send word to Imam Hussein al-Islam because he wants a meeting. So he calls one of the people and he says, you know, go and take this message of mine to Imam Hussein al-Islam. And that person says, ah, you know, I really don't want to go because I'm one of those who sent the letters to him. So he asks for another person, same excuse. It's like, okay, what face I'm going to show him? I'm the one who wrote that letter. Third person, same thing. And he goes through a whole list of people and it's the same thing. Which also shows that all of these people that have come, or rather the vast majority of these people that have come in, against Imam Hussein al-Islam were the ones who were asking him to come and defend them in Kufa. So eventually the meeting takes place. And so, you know, Amr course, he says that, oh, you know, you have the option of, you know, the option is that you accept Yazid as your le leader and give bayah to him, allegiance to him, you know, or, you know, the army is here. So Imam Hussein al-Islam, he says, look, I give you three options. Pick one of them. Either allow me to go back to Makkah. And that's it. End of this. We all go. We go back to Mecca. You go back to where you came, and everything's over with. Or you exile me to a foreign land, outside of your territory, outside of your empire, and I will live my life out there, preaching Islam to the non-Muslims and to anyone who's willing to listen to me. Or 
you take me to Yazid, and I will discuss and deal with him on a personal level. So when Amr, he hears, you know, these three options, he says, you know, he says, this is good. Now I'm sure that one of these is going to be acceptable. So he sends a message to Ibn Ziyad in Kufa. The letter stating that these are the options that Imam Hussein al-Islam has given us and we're, you know, I think we should accept one of them. When the message arrived, Shimr uh, Zyoshin was sitting next to Ibn Ziyad in Kufa. And Shimr is one of the leaders in Kufa. Uh, he's one of those who initially was supporter of Ahlul Bayt and then became turned against them, which is common. You know, if people see which way they're going to gain which way they think they're going to gain something from, and that's the path they take. Shimmer technically is the, is the maternal uncle of Abbas Alamdar, you know, the brother of Imam Hussein al -Salam. And so Shimmer is sitting there, and when the letter arrives to Ibn Ziyad, he reads it and they look at it. And Ibn Ziyad starts thinking, well, maybe we accept one of these. And then Shimmer says, ah, you know, this is the game. This is the trick of Imam Hussein. And this, uh, you know, if, you know and, and this shows you uh, that Amr is not willing to do what is necessary. Because if we lose him now, then we will never be able to capture him. If we let him go, you know, from here alive, then we will never be able to control him. Important point to understand why that third option was not an option for them. Because people would think, oh, you know, if he goes to meet uh, Yazid, then what's the issue with that? Yeah. Is that if he goes to meet Yazid, they also know that he's not going to give his hand in the hand of Yazid. And if he goes to meet Yazid, then everybody will know who he is. And that was one of the things that they feared, that, oh, if we, if we postpone or delay this, then others will come in support of Imam Hussein. When they find out what's going on, then others will come and we won't be able to handle the situation. So Shimmer says to Ibn Ziyad that, look, you know, if Amr is not willing to do this, then send me. And I will be the, I, you know, that he hands over the governorship of Ray, of Tehran, and I will also become the commander of this army. I have no hesitation in doing what needs to be done. So Ibn Ziyad says, sounds good. So he sends message with Shimmer. To Amr. And along with the message is also that the Euphrates should be cut off so that none of the people of Imam Hussein al Islam can get any water from the Euphrates because Karbala is right on the banks of the Euphrates. So now when Shamar arrives and he hands the letter from, from Ibn Ziyad to Amr, Amr reads it and says, you know, basically the letter says that, look, you know, either fulfill your mission, you know, the options of, of Imam Hussein al-Islam that he gives allegiance to Yazid or he dies. That's it. No other options are acceptable. So either he gives his hand in the hand of Yazid and says, I accept you as my ruler and leader, or he will be executed. Uh, and and if you're not willing to fulfill this mission, then hand over, you know, the governorship of Iran of Tehran and also the army to Shimmer. And so, Amr, when he reads this, he looks at Shimmer. He says, "This is all you're doing. You know, I wanted to save us from the blood of Imam Hussein al-Islam, but this is all you're doing." Again, 
He knows. But you know, the lure of this world pulls him in a different direction. Which is why, you know, many people we think, you know, when we read the history and we, we look at the statements of Abu Jahl, Umay, uh, uh, Walid bin Mughira. Walid bin Mughira, you know, he's one of the leaders of Quraysh. He is actually the oldest, he, at that time when Rasulullah declared his prophethood, he was the oldest and most respected leader of Quraysh because he was the oldest among them, amongst them. And when he heard Surah Inna Athena, he says that this is not the word, these are not the words of a human being. So he immediately knew because his Arabic was very good. You know, he was master of the language. So when he heard the Quranic language, he immediately knew. Even the short surah, the shortest surah. He said, this is, these are not the words of a human. And so he intended on becoming Muslim. And he made it clear that I'm going to go and meet Muhammad وسلم, and accept him. And when, he made, when this became known among Quraysh, Abu Jahal came running to him with this long face. And so... Walid, he asked Abu Jahl, he says, what's wrong? He says, oh, you know, I'm so sad, you know, I've become so sad because you've become poor. Huh. He had ten sons, a lot of wealth, and he was very proud of all of this. He says, oh, you become poor. And Abu Walid says, what do you mean I become poor? He says, you know, I heard you're going to go and, uh, you know, you're going to Muhammad to beg from him. And Abu Jahl knew how to turn the key there. So Walid, in his arrogance and his pride, now he says, Allah, what are you talking about? You know, that I'm going to beg from him. You know, I could, uh, I could own him. Astaghfirullah. 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 And then he calls a meeting for Quraysh. Yeah. All of Quraysh. That we need to be we need to have a consensus on how we deal with Rasulullah, how we deal with Muhammad You know, because when people come for Hajj and one person is saying that, oh, you know, he's astaghfirullah, he's crazy, and another person is saying that, oh, no, he's a liar, another person is saying, no, he's a magician, another person is saying he's possessed, then people will, will realize that there's something wrong, that what we're accusing him of can't be true, because all of these things can't be true at the same time. And they'll start and go and listen to him. So we need to stop that. So we need to have a consensus on what we're going to say. So the people, they said, you tell us and we'll abide by whatever you say. You know, we, you're our oldest leader and we, whatever you say, we'll go. So he says, no, I want to hear from you first. And so one of them stands up and he says, well, let's say that he's, he's a liar. And Walid himself, he says, that's not going to work. Because we're the ones who gave him the title of Sadiq al -Amin. You know, The truthful and the trustworthy. So if we say he's a liar, then the people will say, well, why did you call him Sadiq al -Amin? So that's not going to work. So he says, well, another person stands up and he says, well, you know, let's say that he's, he's a soothsayer. A kahin. So Walid, he says, yeah, that's not going to work. Because he doesn't do the things that soothsayers do. You know, the way they, they like, you know, like here, they speaking in tongues or rambling or whatever. He, says, he doesn't do any of that stuff. So people will look at him and realize, uh, you know, that's not right. Something, something doesn't fit. So one person, he says, well, let's say that he's a magician. And Walid says, well, you know, he doesn't... He doesn't act and speak like magicians speak. So that's also not going to work. Another one says, well, let's say that he's possessed. You know, some jinn has taken over him. And Walid himself, he says, that's not going to work either because, you know, he doesn't act like a possessed man. 
<laughs> so they run through a few things, and then they eventually say, look, you know, we don't know what to say. You tell us. So then, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this in Surah Qalam and Surah Mudathir. You know, that he, uh, you know, that he frowned. Abasa wa basar. You know, he frowned and, and uh, uh, turned his face. You know, some people, you know, if you're not used to thinking, it's hard. So, you know, they're straining to think. So he's thinking. And he says, look, the best we can do is to say that he's a magician who separates the brother from the brother and the fa brother, son from the father. Because, you know, people that were becoming Muslim, their families were throwing them out. He says, that's the best we can do. So the same person who was ready, he knew that the Qur'an is, is definitely not something that Rasulullah has come up with from his pocket. He had no doubt that Rasulullah is the Messenger of Allah. But his ego... Because he, does, he is not willing to love Rasulullah more than he loves himself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, does not grant him guidance. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala devoids us of guidance, then we go all over the place. And you see the extreme that he goes to. From being ready to accept Islam to the one who's instigating the people against Islam. And so we see the same thing in Karbala. You know, these are people who knew who, who Imam Hussein al-Islam is. But you know, they're not willing to love him more than they love themselves. Because again, you know, Imam Hussein al-Islam literally is a part of Rasulullah. You know, this isn't me saying this. This is what Rasulullah himself said. And a whole is the sum of the parts. So I can't claim to love the whole and not love the parts. And so they set 4,000 men on the morning of the 7th of, of Muharram. They set 4,000 men along the Euphrates. So that no one from the camp of Imam Hussein al-Islam can come and get any water. You know, you're in the desert. And, you know, of course, if you look at it, you know, if I look at it uh, from a, uh, you know, it's the 10th of, or it's Muharram. Muharram that year was in October. So somebody can argue, well, it's, you know, it, it's cool. But anybody who knows the desert knows that, yeah, even when it's cool, it's still dry. You know, it's like with my patients, I have a hard time convincing them that they need to drink plenty of water in the winter time too. They say, well, I don't feel thirsty, but you're still losing so much fluids through your breathing. And if you're in a dry climate, you're losing even more. So they run out of, by that, afternoon they're out of water and food because the plan was to get to, to Kufa so they carried enough food supplies to get to Kufa so they're out of water out of food <coughs> and none of them you know it's interesting you know a poet mentions that you know even the dogs and the cats can come and drink the birds and everybody else can come and drink Yet Imam Hussein al-Islam and those with him, the water is banned. So when they do this, Imam Hussein al-Islam, he sends a few of his men to go and talk to the people of Yazid. And they go to them and say, look, you know, you're thousands 
You know, we're not even a hundred. Even if we drink water, what difference does it make for you? I mean, literally, you think about this. Tens of thousands of people against not even a hundred. Even if the hundred are well armed, at that, you know, you think about warfare at that time, even if they were well armed and they had plenty of food and plenty of water, you know, and it's not like there's, there's like, you know, some place that they can hide, you know, or, or do some guerrilla warfare. You're out in the open. What difference does it make? But when the hearts are devoid of Iman, then, you know, the minds don't make any sense. And Imam Hussein al-Islam didn't send these men because he was thinking that they would convince them. He knew they weren't going to convince them. That is why the angel of rain came to Rasulullah. <laughs> you know, and told, and, and basically to ask for forgiveness for not making it rain. Because yeah, they control the Euphrates, but they don't control the rain. You know, and when tears are flowing down the, the, the beautiful face of Rasulullah and Ali then one time he asked him, he says, Ya Rasulullah, why are you crying like this? He says, he tells him that, you know, this angel came and he told me this. Not again, not because he didn't know, he knew. But again, certain things trigger that memory. And then he says, he says to him, he says, I cannot, I cannot control my tears. You know, when we listen to what they did to, to Imam Hussein al-Islam and, and his family, yeah. if we can't shed a tear, then there's something wrong with our hearts. Rasulullah s.a.w. himself, he says, I cannot control my tears over this. <clears throat> so now, you know, they come back and of course, you know, the response is no, you can't get any water. And, you know, another day passes, same situation. On the ninth of, of Zilhaj, or on the ninth of Muharram, Imam Hussein al-Islam, he goes before them, himself. By himself, he walks up to the army. Of course, they're surrounded, so he goes to you know where the leaders are, and the concentration of the army is, and he gives a khutbah. You know, he addresses them, and he speaks to them. And we're gonna, because of time short, we're gonna go over this next week, inshallah. But when you listen to the khutbah, it's a reflection of what we see today throughout the Muslim world. Because he talks about the rulers, you know, who are oppressive rulers, but the main aspect of the oppression is that they make halal what is haram, and they make haram what is halal. You know. and, it, and the interesting thing is, the psychology of it is, that they tend to start making uh, hal, hal, haram what's halal first. And this is why when, this, when the Saudis came, what was the first thing? Bida is haram. This is haram. Yeah. Saying, Ya Rasulullah is haram. Huh. To the extent that, you know, one of the uh, religious police, you know, he was talking in, he, in, in Medina Munawara, and he says that you should not make the masjid filthy. And, you know, if you, and if somebody wants to see the clip, you know, I can show them the clip. But uh, it says, you should not make the masjid filthy. You know, and, and, you know, leaving trash on the masjid makes it filthy. Saying, Ya Rasulullah makes the masjid filthy. Because in the masjid, you only remember Allah. 
Which means you can't even make salat now because in the salat you say Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyu. And ayyuh is more emphatic than ya. Because ya can be for someone who is near or far. Ayyuh is only for the one who is present. An nabi awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. You know, Allah says in Surah Ahzab, that this prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves, than their own souls. So Allah protect us and help us, and inshallah we'll continue next week. Uh, and may He fill our hearts with His true love and the true love of His beloved Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah go in, make sunnah, inshallah.